Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jisoo Kim, Director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. Welcome to the second Joseon Book Talk series. Today's guest speaker is my good colleague and friend, Professor George Callender. He's my sambe from Columbia University. Um, today's book talk will be based on Professor Callender's translation of Namangap's The Diary of 1637, which is based on the second Manchu invasion of Korea. Uh, this translation is a welcome addition to the field, and I'll be use, I'll definitely be using this book next semester in my History of Korea class uh, when teaching about the Manchu invasion. Um, th this book will be essential for anyone interested in Manchu-Korean relations in the 17th century. Um, before I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Callender, uh, I would like to mention that like last time we pre prepared a book giveaway event and we'll be sending uh, the book to, we'll be sending um, this book, uh, Professor Callender's uh, book uh, talk today um, to, to um, one of the, uh, authors, uh, oh, sorry, one of the attendees uh, who submitted a question to our author. So please submit your question to Q&A box, not chat box, um, and we'll ask the author to select the winner after the event. Um, our staff will then be in touch with you and um, later this week uh, to mail uh, this book to your address. All right, so it is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor George Callender. I'm so delighted to have him as our guest speaker today. Um, Professor George Callender is an Associate Professor of History at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University, where he is Director of the East Asia Program at the Monihan Institute of Global Affairs. His research focuses on early modern Korea. He's the author of two books, The Diary of 1636, The Second Manchu Invasion of Korea, uh, published by Columbia University Press in 2020, and Salvation Through Descent, Tongak Heterodoxy in Early Modern Korea, uh, published by University of Hawaii in 2013. He's um, the co-editor of the Cambridge History of Korea project uh, of the Joseon Dynasty volume. And he's also currently completing a new monograph tentatively titled Beastly Rights, Human-Animal Relations and the Haunt in Pre-Modern Korea. We will certainly invite him back when uh, he publishes this book. <laughs> so now please join me in welcoming Professor Callender. George, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jisoo Kim. It's great to see you. Um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. And I also want to thank uh, Min Hae Kim at the Institute for Korean Studies. Uh, thank you both for the invitation to give a talk on my new book right here. I have the paperback version. I would also like to acknowledge the Academy of Korean Studies and also Columbia University Press for their support of uh, my project. So I'm really excited to be here and join you today uh, and talk about my book through Zoom. So today I'm going to talk about my new book, uh, The Diary of 1636, The Second Manchu Invasion of Korea or Byungjaruk, or The Diary of 1636-1637. It's a famous diary by Naman Gap. He was a scholar official of the Korean court. In his work, Na narrates the 1637 war against the Manchu in the areas outside of Namhan Mountain Fortress, where he, the king, the crown prince, and members of the military and court sought refuge. And he also discusses the aftermath of the battles. My book includes a translation of the diary from Hanmun or literary Chinese, and I heavily annotate it uh, and write a lengthy introduction, all to help introduce this important period to scholars and students and others. In part of my talk today, I'll first discuss the Manchu Korean struggles of the first half of the 17th century, Next, I'll focus our attention to the writer, Dao Man Gap, and offer some insight into his experiences and reasons for composing the diary. Then I'll conclude by offering a few comments about what we can learn from these struggles during the Manchu Wars. At the end, uh, I know we'll have plenty of time uh, for any questions, and I have uh, apparently a lot of uh, pressure because I have to choose the winner of the, uh, the book award to give out my book to the best question. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of pressure. But first, um, why this book? 
I grew interested in this period and the diary of 1636 because of what they represent. As a historian, I'm really interested in these moments uh, of massive disruption, how they rattle people, rattle societies and regions, and how people respond as they begin to think about themselves and the world in new ways. And this is certainly a moment where this is happening. Here, it's in this tumultuous era following the disorder of the Japanese Imjin War uh, that Ming China and Chosun Korea fought against Japan from 1592 to 1598. And in its aftermath, the geopolitical shift from Ming Dynasty China to the rising Manchu Jin and then Qing, and what it all meant for Korean society, politics, and identity. So Man, Naman Gap's uh, diary really illustrates these moments of, um, pretty well. And the writer uh, of the diary himself, I'll talk more about later, he lived in this world turned upside down. He was born at the beginning of the Imjin War. He survived the war as a baby. He was brought up in post Imjin War period survived two Manchu attacks in 1627 and 1637, and uh, survived the aftermath of those attacks. This intensified climate of factionalism and political retribution in Chosun Korean politics and society. First, a little background to sort of set the frame uh, for 1636 and 1637. Um, in the early the 17th century, Northeast Asia was undergoing a major shift in power dynamics. It saw the decline of the Chinese Ming Dynasty in mainland China and the rise of the Manchu Qing in Northeast Asia. The Ming Chosun Alliance uh, defeating Japan in the Imjin War ended Japanese ambitions for empire on the continent and ushered in an era of great peace under Tokugawa. So you can see this area, this region was changing and Korea was changing too. Uh, recovering from the devastating war that saw Chosun and Ming fighting against Japan throughout the peninsula, uh, Korea underwent reforms of its own. We see in this era, uh, and I outline it more in the introduction, slow expansion of new tax policies that helped rationalize the economy and more importantly helped rebuild um, and this would eventually be transformational. And it would help spur social expansion, especially from the 18th century onward. Also, the government undertook some military reforms to help fix what they saw as the military problems that emerged during the engine period. So early in the 17th century, uh, we have Korean King, uh, King Guang Hegun, who uh, was undergoing many of these reforms. He understood the shifting geopolitical winds. Uh, and in a sense, his relations with the Manchu helped placate the Manchu. But much of these improvements uh, and much of these were consumed uh, by uh, this growing international storm between the Ming and the Manchu, which Chosun had to navigate through. Foremost was the decision that realigned Korea with the Ming. In this era of shifting power from the Ming to the Manchu, in particular in 1623, uh, the pro-Manchu, well, it might be a little, maybe um, not anti-Manchu, King Guanghegun was deposed by a pro-Ming faction that brought a new ruler, King Injo, to the throne. And king Injo was a weak king dominated by the bureaucratic officials who had enthroned him. And these were a group of politicians who were strongly uh, belligerent towards the Manchu and uh, highly supportive of the Ming. These officials permitted Chinese generals access to Chosun territory and Chosun took advantage of this to construct, to construct bases. Uh, the Chinese took advantage of this to construct bases on Korean islands 
along the northwest coast. This and others, right? And now uh, a few words then um, of 1627, the Manchu attack. With designs to invade China, Manchu first attacked across the Korean frontier in 1627, demanding that Chosun's King Injo end this diplomatic relationship with the Ming. The Manchu did not want the Ming there and sent an army into Korea in 1627 to dislodge the Ming from the area and force Korea into an alliance. Well, within days of this attack, the Manchu armies crossing the Yellow River in 1627, the court learned uh, from those that had fled south uh, that the border towns had fallen to the enemy and it was a rapid Manchu attack and a uh, highly chaotic Chosun response. And so reports spoke of great Manchu momentum. As part of the response, Chosun armies in the northern provinces of Guanghe uh, and Pyongan, northern regions, amounting to roughly 1,700 troops, were ordered to defend against them. In the city of Pyongyang, around the center of the peninsula, 5,800 troops fortified the city and fortresses, while Archers from surrounding villages were called on to defend uh, the castle and the city. Well, despite this, uh, Manchu troops uh, still advanced rapidly, quickly along the main roads. And uh, reports that reached Seoul of the strengths of the Manchu forces uh, were frightening. Um, in the face of all this advance, the Chosun troops appeared to resist engaging the Manchu. One official criticized the inaction of the troops, reporting, quote, as the enemy advances, not one person comes forward bravely determined to die. Another complained, quote, it's been days since the enemy invaded and not one of our soldiers has cut the throat of an enemy soldier and claimed a reward. So you can see here then in 1627, this rapid advance of Manchu troops to Seoul and Gangwa Island. Gangwa Island, right? It's very important to know about. This is a strategic island west of the capital where um, traditionally the king and the court fled or took refuge, um, especially during uh, Northern invasions. Again, again in 1627, the king and the court and capital elites withdrew there. Um, but Manchu attacks forced the court to sever relations with the Ming. The king surrendered. As part of this formality, King Injo swore, quote, an alliance of friendship with the great Jin Manchu dynasty. Originally refusing to give up this Ming alliance, this move now forced Chosun to formally ally with the Manchu. And the Manchu and the Korean sides held a surrender ritual to formalize this. This is where their alliance was formalized over the blood of a horse and an ox as sacrifice. And when making this alliance, King Injo noted that if Chosun broke the pledge and the Manchu troops had to invade again, well, disaster would befall the dynasty. This was a telling premonition of things to come. However, despite the outcome of this first attack, as we know, uh, Chosun never fully accepted the Manchu as a replacement for the Ming and continued their support of China. All of this culminated in 1636 and 1637. And so in 1627, after the Manchu troops withdrew, uh, King Injo openly refused to honor the promise he had made to be loyal to the Manchu. He rejected official communications with them. He also allowed Ming generals back into Korean territory and welcomed Ming envoys back at the court. And all of these exacerbated the situation. A number of diplomatic slights though, between the Manchu and the Chosun really suggest how small grievances helped lead to war. One was the funeral ceremony of Queen Inyo in 1635, a senior member of the royal family who had passed away. Um, ceremony was being held for her and the Manchu um, uh, sent representatives to pay respects to her. It was a top Manchu general and his men. 
uh, they attended the ceremony. Um, but when the Chosun military and government apparently threatened and disrespected these Manchu representatives in a small incident, um, relations between the two countries chilled. Another uh, was the way the Chosun court dealt with diplomatic letters. And this is a really important part of the story, right? Now, the way that the Chosun court accepted or largely refused to accept these diplomatic responses. Uh, this was a big problem. And generally, usually the court ignored them. Uh, even letters from the new Manchu Qing emperor to the king of Korea, uh, Chosun ignored them. And so 1635, around this era, um, around this time, by then leadership in both countries were preparing for war. Uh, by 1636, after the incidents and the letters, popular opinion uh, in Korea now strongly advocated fighting the Manchu, overlooking, of course, the outcome of 1627. And so as a response to punish Chosun Dynasty for breaking the 1627 oath, a much more formidable Manchu army struck the peninsula at the beginning of 1637. Remember, while eager politically to sever relations with the Ming in 1627 and realign with the Ming, Chosun struggled again with a response to the Manchu in 1636 and 1637. Militarily, they could not stop the Manchu. Uh, on this occasion, the Manchu also brought a more formidable army and military leadership with them, including seasoned Mongol troops. Uh, even the Manchu emperor himself arrived in the scene and to indicate that the Manchu really meant business this time. And it was a different form, different, um, different outcome. The Manchu struck quickly, uh, overwhelming a poorly prepared military and communication structure Instead of attacking mountain fortresses um, where Korean troops were held up, especially in the Northwest, the Manchu simply rode around them, um, sent elements of the cavalry, for instance, south in rapid uh, strikes. They reached Seoul within days, three, four days, uh, completely taking the Korean court um, by surprise. And cut off from escape routes now then, especially to Kangwa Island, the king, uh, the court and capital guard had no choice but to move southeast to the nearby uh, Namhan mountain fortress. Well, Namhan is well known and uh, now it's a beautiful location, great today for hikes and uh, going to view the autumn leaves. If you have been to Korea or you have a chance, please go there. But then between 1627 and 1636, this is an important defensive region for the court. And even within that decade, um, the court had strengthened it in preparation for an attack like this. And in fact, the defenses of Namhan Mountain uh, were fairly efficient. Uh, they stopped the Manchu assaults, at least for the moment. Right? Uh, and the Manchu never militarily overcame uh, Namhan Mountain Fortress, uh, but there were military problems elsewhere. Right. For instance, uh, getting messages in and out of Namhan uh, was difficult because of the Manchu lines. Manchu was holding siege to Namhan. There was little coordination among military leaders and forces. The Manchu simply went around mountain fortresses uh, and they uh, concentrated forces at strategic um, sites that they wanted to attack, like Gangwa Island in particular. And then Namhan Mountain Fortress. Uh, but also very different from 1627 here, we have um, the help of two seasoned Ming Chinese generals who were highly skilled at amphibious warfare. They were with the invasion force and also there to help assist the Manchu. So the Manchu easily overcame the defenses at Gangwa Island. And remember, this is the traditional last line of defense against invaders from the north. Uh, this is at this time in 1637. This is where the wife of the crown prince, other high members of the capital elite, uh, had withdrawn. So, 1637, chosen military situation was dire. A description of one early battle provides you uh, with an example of what they were living through. Quote That morning, a military officer was first dispatched 
with roughly 80 cavalry uh, to go and confront the enemy. As they were saying their farewells and leaving, they drank too much of the rice wine bestowed by his highness and the farewell drinks of their relatives and friends. From the guard officer on down, there was no one who was not intoxicated. They arrived at the hills of Chang'un and climbed towards the frontier. The enemy annihilated them and only a few survived. So this is the situation that the Chosun military troops find themselves when they go out to attack. They do have some successes, a number of smaller ones, um, but it's not enough to save them from Manchu. And much of the war was fought along a corridor from the frontier uh, in the Northwest, down the peninsula to the capital around Seoul, including Namhan Mountain to the Southeast and Gangwa Island to the Southwest. But among all of these, uh, it was Namhan Mountain and Gangwa Island that were the two most important centers of the struggle. Remember, the King, Crown Prince and court officials withdrew to Namhan. And as I said earlier, the wife and the crown prince, the wife of the crown prince and other members of the capital elite and royal family uh, were on Gangwa Island. Okay, another very important aspect of this period in 1637 and one that really fascinates me uh, is that it's not just a military battle, right? Fought on the battlefield, but it was an epistolary struggle, right? It was fought with brush and paper. Letters in particular featured prominently in the invasion. In fact, the diary begins um, with a chosen diplomatic snub of the Qing Emperor's letter in the spring of 1636. And this was a major problem. So then in letters, diplomatic correspondences from the Chosun court, um, there were few, if any, references to the 1627 attack and also agreement uh, and a breaking of the alliance in any of these letters from the Korean side. But the Manchu leaders uh, certainly remembered that moment of 1627. And many of their formal letters uh, specifically referenced the severing of relations in 1627 as a reason for the invasion uh, and attack in 1637. I'm gonna read a little bit of the Manchu Emperor Hong Taiji's letter to the Korean King. Quote, I carefully considered the oath taken in 1627. Many times I've repeatedly enlightened you when your country contemplated breaking the oath. You are not afraid of heaven. You did not want to save the commoners who were in distress and you turned against the oath at first. My envoy, got hold of your letters from your subjects along the frontier. From that, we began to realize that your country was planning war. I used to tell your two envoys and several merchants, your country is rude like that. You will invade, we will invade your country soon. You can return to inform your king and everyone under heaven to the commoners. He goes on, the information we gave them is clear and we sent it to you. So you can see here, writing and diplomacy through letters. There was no treachery involved uh, when I secretly mobilized my army. Um, I prepared a letter for these envoys to take back to you. And after you violated the oath of 1627 and troubled heaven, it was time that I asked heaven and then dispatched the army to suppress you. If I disobey an oath, I would fear being punished by heaven because true that you betrayed the oath and calamity struck your country. So Hong Taiji is very concerned about letters and, and uh, epistles. And he critiques some of the Chosun letters, uh, line by line even. You, King Injo, also wrote, he goes on, our small country is located in one corner of a remote sea, Chosun wrote. We still strive to follow the book of songs and the book of classics, Chinese um, studies rather than military arts. And we are unfamiliar with war. But Hong Taiji goes on, critiques it. In 1619, uh, when Chosun army supported Ming troops in attacking the Manchu in Manchuria, and without cause, you invaded our lands. I believe your country is familiar with military affairs. Now uh, you've begun to provoke us again, and your troops grow seasoned. 
and from now on, uh, you will have more chances to train your army, suggesting just carry out the battle on the field. He goes on. Uh, in 1592, uh, our small country, this is a reference to the Korean letter now, our small country was on the verge of destruction. Emperor Shenzong of the Ming Dynasty mobilized all the troops under heaven and saved our lives from untold miseries. All right, now the, uh, the Qing emperor is critiquing Koreans. The world is expansive and holds many countries. As for saving your kingdom, the Ming is just one country. So how could troops from all countries have come? You and the Ming always ridiculed it. Uh, are, um, are uh, ridiculous and reckless and never sees fatalities and absurdities. And this is most importantly here, he emphasizes you violated our brotherly friendship. So he emphasizes a brotherly friendship made in 1627 and prepared for war. And as an excuse, um, justification for invading Korea again, he said, you are waiting for the day when I leave for an expedition west toward the Ming so you can make the most of that chance to quietly use your soldiers and harm our country. Also, uh, Hong Taiji references many letters that the, uh, the Manchu intercepted, Chosun letters, in which these letters, the Chosun officials and soldiers always um, belittle Manchu troops, especially calling them slave thieves. He says, hmm, well, if we are indeed thieves, then why don't you catch us? And the emperor concludes, now, if you want to live, come out of Nam Han Fortress quickly and surrender. If you want to fight, come out and quickly fight. Well, I read a, I read a bit of Hong Taiji's letters to Chosun King Injo to demonstrate the level of anger the Manchu felt towards Injo and the court for ending the 1627 pact. And the consequences of all these small diplomatic snubs of 1635, in particular 1636, leading up to the invasion. Well, Chosun uh, diplomatic relations were courteous. Their diplomatic responses were courteous, but officials searched for ways to diminish the humiliation Koreans felt over Manchu demands. For example, one Korean letter uh, wrote, the Korean court recognized the superiority of the Qing emperor, but insisted that the siege be lifted and Manchu forces withdrawn from the country before King Injo would perform rites inside the fortress rather than coming outside to surrender in honor of the Manchu troops, apparently hoping this would satisfy Manchu surrender demands. It did not. So the diplomatic correspondence and the exchange of letters during the peace negotiations was not only for practical purposes, such as providing a means to discuss surrender, but it also became a way for both sides to fight with paper and brush. The diary records no fewer than 10 letters exchanged during the invasion. Each side attempted to explain its position based on moral Confucian high ground and in the end, Manchu military threats. Chosun leaders argue that sincerity of their Confucian heritage in connection to the Ming, especially regarding the obligation owed the Ming for helping save the Chosun dynasty from the Japanese. Well, Chosun was a country of scholarship that did not know war, one Korean dispatch argued, while another court letter suggested the main reason for Qing anger emerged from just a simple misunderstanding of history and Confucian dictates. Well, uh, the Manchu responded to such letters forcefully, arguing that the duplicity of the Chosun, which they claimed was an un-Confucian characteristic, the building of military defenses and the capture of land and people along the Northern frontier, these were all suggestive of a country knowledgeable of war. The Korean court was adept at deploying Confucian symbolism, including self-denigration, and historical references to justify his actions. But what was also very fascinating for me in doing the diary was that, well, what may seem surprising is the deafness and complexity of the Manchu Qing response. Chosun may have claimed greater Confucian legitimacy and heritage, right, based on this long and lengthy history of engaging Confucian classics and also China, 
But Manchu, through their interpreters and letter writers, they proved an equal of Korea in the written responses. So in many ways, the war on the battlefield fought also through the exchange of letters proved challenging for Korea to surmount. And the Manchu were becoming as powerful with a brush as they were with a sword. So another important discussion of the court in Namhan um, was the wording of the surrender letter. The Qing demanded the use of the word uh, subject, Xin. Uh, the Qing wanted this, they needed it in the letter to demonstrate the hierarchical relationship. Well, officials at the chosen court in Nahan Mountain Fortress hemmed and hawed about what to do. They were unsure how to respond to this. So in some really telling moments in the diary, uh, it was one official from the anti-peace group, Kim Sang-hun, who took it upon himself to rip up the initial surrender letter. And another official from the pro-peace group, uh, Che Myung Gil, to take another diplomatic letter from the Korean king and insert the word subject into it. Well, obviously this satisfied the Qing leaders, but enraged the anti-Manchu faction in the Korean court. Despite these military epistle defeats, the Korean court surrendered only after the capture of Gangwa Island. This is where, remember, the wife of the crown prince, many members of the royal family, and the capital elites had retreated to. And now in 1637, uh, things were very different for Chosun. Chosun was again forced to sever relations with the Manchu, uh, sever relations with the Ming and enter into relations with the Manchu. And also the surrender terms were harsher. These included hostages sent north, the intermarriage of the children of elite family members with the Manchu elite, and the construction of a monument depicting the Manchu side of the events of 1637. All of these were very humiliating. However, what is important to remember is that this moment, unlike the Indian War against Japan, uh, not all Koreans were unified against the Manchu. During the Indian War, the country united against the Japanese, although factionalism, political factionalism in the court remained very strong and very evident. But then, uh, while in the case of the Manchu, the Korean bureaucracy and army split. Many officials remained devoted to the Ming, while civil and military leaders argued that the country should support the Manchu. Compared to the Indian War, then, uh, the Manchu Wars, while not as physically destructive, were devastating in terms of politics and national morale. The Indian War uh, did not change Chosen politics, though it did wash away some of the earlier objections that Chosen liter literati had against the Ming, but it was really the Manchu Wars uh, that were so rapid and uh, they were conducted with such a small and military, which moved quickly in and out of Korea, that Chosen appeared to have been struck by lightning. Unlike the Japanese in the Indian War, uh, the Manchu stopped once they captured the Chosen capital uh, and Gangwa, signaling defeat. And uh, these rapid invasions severed Korean contact with the Ming on both occasions. Having reneged the first time in 1627, the reprisal of the second invasion was more consequential for Korea. All of the princes in line for the throne and the children of leading officials were transported back with the Manchu as hostages. They were released later. Um, and by then these people had established connections and lines of communication with the Manchu. Some of them learned their customs, languages and politics. And to some, this was a positive thing, right? A positive result and a way to further communicate with the Manchu. But to others in Korea, um, they thought that these hostages were too closely aligned with the Manchu and could pose a threat. What Chosun defeat meant um, for China, Korea's direct neighbor was evident. The Manchu were an ascending power in Northeast Asia, um, heralding the end of the revered Ming and the transformation of Northeast Asia and Chosun politics and society. So I'd like to move on now then to the writer of the diary, Namangap. Namangap was not a high official, nothing like a senior statesman or part of the super elite for the capital. 
He was from a prominent family in South Jala province, uh, far from the capital ge geographically, but his grandfather and father had success in the exams and found appointments in the government. After passing the state exams uh, himself, Na managed to work his way up to the capital, married well, found some success in various appointments. And one of those brought him in to close proximity to the court. While serving in the court under King uh, Guanghegun, he stepped down for a while in protest over the king's political intrigues, as did others, and returned to service when King Injo was enthroned. Namangap was working at the court for King Injo uh, during the 1627 Manchu attack, accompanying the king and court to Gangwa Island in the retreat, the first retreat. He survived the attack in 1627, uh, and also the attack a decade later, 1637, when he retreated with the court now to Namhan Mountain Fortress. So he was present at Namhan throughout the invasion where he heard many of the military experiences and witnessed a great deal of the political battles at the court. Surviving the 1637 invasion, he collided with the leader of an opposing factional group. This animosity carried over into the post-1637 period. And on some of the flimsiest of charges, he was accused of purchasing a stolen government boat to help him get back to his hometown to attend his mother's funeral. He was attacked politically and banished for good. But this was both good and bad. So now away from Seoul, away from his responsibilities in the capital, he had time to edit and expand the diary. In exile, he had a mission as he states, to record the history of the Manchu invasion. He was well aware of the passing of the generations with their stories too, of those who lived through the Imjin War against the Japanese. He did not want the story of 1637 to be lost as had many writings from 40 years earlier. So that was one of his missions for writing the diary. It wasn't his only mission. He composed the diary in eight sections. He wrote one section during the war, but the other sections were composed and edited after 1637. To give it a sense of his priorities, uh, he titled the other sections, I'll read them here, Gangwa Island Records, uh, record of several people who rejected peace negotiations and died of righteousness, miscellaneous notes concerning what happened after the upheaval, record of Chang'um slandering, he was Kim sang Hun, the official who tore up the initial surrender letter, among other interesting things that he did. And the final station was humiliation received from the Qing. So you can see here then, the diary of 1636, 1637 is a narration of the Manchu invasion of Korea and the political and social aftermath of a pre-modern society at war. But it's more than that. I argue there's a lot going on beneath the surface of the diary. Na subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, critiques the contemporary politics of the Chosun dynasty in the structure and tone and the context of the stories he tells in the diary. His critiques range from the decisions to go to war to the bitter environment of political retribution that saw many officials expelled from Seoul, the center of power, including himself. As he was gently agitating against uh, the outcome of the war and the fall from power of many officials, he reminds readers of the rippling impact of the invasion on power relations in Northeast Asia. The war disrupted ties between dynasties and fractured loyalties at all levels. Korea redirected relations to the Manchu capital now, Mukden, and away from Beijing, challenging chosen loyalty to the Ming. Ming Chinese soldiers switched sides and fought for the Qing. Mongols joined the invasion force. Chosun military men supported the Manchu. Korean officials split between pro-peace and pro-war. And even a handful of expatriate Japanese fought alongside Chosun. So as I describe in my book, duty and obligation are some of the most telling subtexts of this era. Where does one's responsibilities rest? 
especially at times of war? Should they be focused on a sense of national obligation or the protection of the country and the king? At other times, uh, when the threat of the country, threat to the country has passed, are one's obligations defined by filial piety to parents, family, and clan, and to village? The Manchu invasion then pushed this age old theoretical debate into practice. And Na's work highlights the slipperiness of loyalty. In some sections, he spotlights the scholars and soldiers who fought for, and in some cases, died for the king. In other sections, he admires officials who demonstrated their loyalty to the Ming by committing suicide rather than shifting allegiance to the Qing. But in 1637, many more officials remained alive and some were taken captive. Now uh, relays how pro-peace officials shifted their loyalty from the Ming to the Qing and how Na and other officials had questionable loyalty as well. Recall decades earlier, these individuals had not remained loyal to the ousted King Guanghegrin and most of them remained loyal to King Injo, despite the king's capitulation to the Manchu and his rejection of the Ming. So the diary uh, demonstrates how loyalty was fluid. It was a fluid concept and shifting in this period of great upheaval. Some final thoughts I would like to leave you with before I end and then take any questions you might have. So um, many lessons to learn from these important moments and the diary of 1636. One I'd like to leave you with uh, is a lesson of resilience. Right? In the early 17th century, Chosun Dynasty, Korea experienced a period of political, military, and social change uh, with a shift from the Ming to the Qing. Korean leadership struggled then to find a coherent way to stay afloat. It took time, but the upheavals of this era actually led to new opportunities for the country, new ways for the people to imagine themselves in society, the region, and the world. And so the lessons of those de decades should not be lost on us now in the midst of this pandemic. So even when things look bleak, we should all remain optimists. I personally am an optimist, as was Naman. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you so much. Um, that was really a uh, comprehensive overview of the Manchu invasion uh, and also putting into really, you know, um, regional context uh, of the time. I think this translation is really a, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I told you, during, uh, you know, just before the, our event began, but this is really a nice compliment to the previous translation that we have about uh, Kang Hang, so mm -hmm. which was translated by uh, Chaeyoung Kim Ha Bush and uh, Kenneth Robinson. I think yes. that for yeah. those who may not know, the title is uh, Kang Hang, a Korean War Captive in Japan, 1597 to 1600. So that's um, Kang Hang's writings based on Injin War or the Japanese invasion of Korea uh, in the uh, in the 16th century, um, but that was uh, based on Kang Hang, who was an official uh, who was taken as a POW in Japan and, uh, and wrote his writings uh, about the war. And I think your, um, you know, your uh, translation, Namanga's diary, this explains a second Manchu invasion, which really, you know, um, happened not so long after <laughs> the Injun War. So I think it's really important to understand, um, you know, uh, the late, it really provides an important, um, you know, uh, lens to understand late Chosun period. So this is the moment where, you know, we are really, you know, scholars are, tr are um, trying to understand the shift from, uh, you know, early mid to late Chosun, right? And there are a lot of uh, changes um, going, going on uh, during this time period. Yeah. So, um, yeah, before um, I get into, uh, well, we are receiving many questions, <laughs> and, uh, but I would like to, you know, just quickly ask you about, um, you know, some, uh, you, do pr you do briefly mention in your introduction about this as well, but about uh, Namangat's view of, uh, you know, this uh, concept of uh, loyalty and uh, fidelity. 
So especially when it comes to women, as we know, you know, women were uh, taken um, as captives, especially mm -hmm. elite women and those women who returned back to Korea, who returned to Korea, to, to Korea um, after the war, there were, you know, there's this collective action uh, to from elite families to um, have divorce uh, because they were these women were seen as lost um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, losing chastity, right? Those women who lost chastity, but there's a lot, I mean, it's more complicated than that. Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, just your uh, understanding of Namangab's, um, because he does, I think, briefly mention about it. And so, you know, what is your view or understanding of uh, his, um, his, you know, his uh, perspectives on this, you know, loyalty and fidelity uh, during this time period? Yeah, that's a great observation. And for women in this period in particular, um, they have extra burden, right? Because they have the burden of this um, Confucian ideal of chastity uh, and uh, virtue. Uh, and if that is compromised some way, then the only avenue for them should be suicide. Uh, Naman Gap narrates a section of the diary and you know, writes about many officials uh, in the post um, surrender period in 1637 and their wives, uh, family members who are, uh, whose husbands commit suicide, but they force their wives to commit suicide ahead of time and daughters uh, to commit suicide in particular out of fear of, of, of uh, losing their chastity to the, um, to the Manchu invaders to these barbarians. And there are a few episodes. So he's very, he's very um, aware of this, very conscious of this as an issue. Uh, and within the system and within the society and stuff too, he uh, is uh, narrating some of the consequences that women who don't commit suicide uh, fall upon their shoulders. There's one story, one episode where um, and a Confucian official, he narrates, makes up uh, a story um, about his wife saying that she has um, disappeared, basically, uh, where in reality, she was abducted by the Manchu. Uh, she and her uh, daughter were abducted by the Manchu, assuming, presuming then that they were uh, you know, subjected to um, sexual violence, uh, taken as uh, concubines, all of this. So he was castigated then um, for having a family, having wife, having a daughter who fell into Manchu hands. So there's a recognition that Na uh, does demonstrate in the diary. And that was one of the fascinating parts of the story for me is to see more of the impact of war and upheavals like this on women. Of course, they're the elite women, right? Um, and the majority of women uh, in Chosen society, they had other, um, you know, uh, issues that they had to deal with survival on the one hand. Um, but here is not just survival, but it's also, um, you could say, reputation. Uh, because status at the court could depend upon the, the virtue of one's um, wife and daughter. Um, all right, thank you. Um, we have uh, many questions. <laughs> so okay. we'll, begin with, um, we'll begin with Mark Tokola's question. How did geography enter into Joseon's preference for the Ming over the Qing dynasties? Did the Ming feel closer over the Yellow Sea or did the Manchu seem too threatening being on the land border? And then he asked um, just one additional question in the Korean movie, The Fortress, Help, um, is the Korean movie The Fortress helpful to understand the times and events? <laughs> yes. Well, first to the question of Damhan uh, Sansam, the movie. I love Korean historical dramas, so I will never criticize them. I use them as well in my uh, in my courses to help not teach history, but to uh, help show how today people are really remembering history. What important aspects are illuminating for modern viewers because you know they're highly um, uh, dramatized uh, but the settings can be beautiful and the, and the, um, uh, the costuming and all this so I, I like to see these uh, acted out um, 
Uh, and I believe one way, if you uh, watch Mount Mountain Fortress, then you'll definitely want to buy my book as a background to that. Second, geography. I think that's an important question because it's not just, it's, you say the geography of the Ming and Manchu, but it's also the geography of places that are nearby, like Mount Mountain Fortress and Tangwa. There's a big debate at the court about uh, security and the proximity of Namhan versus Kangwa Island. Uh, so the Korean court is very much aware of geographical proximity. When it comes to the Ming and the, the Jurchens, the Manchu, it's a little more complex because it's not just geography, but there's mm, sort of a, like a historical uh, uh, weight of uh, precedence where China and the Ming are not just a geographical presence uh, across the Yellow Sea, West Sea, but it's also, it's a, it's a cultural and scholarly uh, and historical presence as well too. Um, so they're, they feel much more closer, even though the geography, of course, between Seoul and Beijing, is much farther than um, say, just even north across the frontier. And Korea has always had to keep its eye on um, its, geographical neighbors, whether it's the uh, Chinese or the Japanese or the, the Jurchens or the Ketans or the Mongols, or the Manchu. So they're very much aware of this, but it's not always coming down to um, geography in the traditional sense. There's a, a cultural geography too here that the Koreans are very much aware of and they find the Ming uh, closer geographically. Great question. Thank you. Um, so we, next question by the writer. Uh, in your map of the Manchu invasion, you included Tokugawa Japan. Did the closing of Japan around that time change the balance of power in the region? Yeah, I think it's important to mention Japan in this because they were such a force in the late 16th century and the, so the, the, the events that took place during the Indian War and the consequences of it in the 16th century, it's almost like a 180 degrees, uh, you know, because Japan starts looking inward. Uh, and so even though Japan doesn't really speak much during this era, their silence is part of the story. So that's why I include them on the map. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, next question by Edward Dong. Uh, Joseon reinvigoration of Korea after Korea coincided roughly with the rise of a vigorous Ming. Was there any thought among Koreans that a vigorous replacement for Joseon might be in order to parallel decline of Ming and the rise of a vigorous Qing? So if I understand this question about to Recreate Chosun? Is that the question? I think so. I think um, he's asking whether there was an, um, yeah, uh, thought. Was there any thought among Koreans um, that there would be a replacement for Chosun? Replacement for Chosun? No. Yeah. As far as I know, that in this period, there, we don't really see that happening. Um, and so it's firmly established the royal family, the geographical borders, the cultural tradition. Of course, Chosun understood their inheritance from Goryeo, uh, and also they understood their inheritance from earlier dynasties. So there was no sense of ending the Chosun. No, um, it was just to reconstruct the state. To right? reconstruct the state. Yeah, to, um, reconstruct the yeah state. like a revitalization in a, in a way. Right. Uh, Confucian revitalization. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Next, by uh, James Lewis. Uh, could you comment on the geopolitical circumstances of the Ming Qing tr transition? Did the Choson court discuss the extensive Ming resistance to the Manchu? From when was the fall of the Ming clear to Korean court? The North may not have been pacified until 1649. Resistance in the South continued to the revolt of the three feudatories, 1673 to 1681, and Taiwan held out until 1683. Yes, and this is from Jay Lewis, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. Jay, always uh, nice to be in touch with you. Thank you for such a wonderful and complex question, which I could probably write another section of the introduction on. Um, 
But uh, uh, in general, I would say, yes, the Koreans were very much aware of the situation going on uh, in um, the Ming. And you know, even despite the, uh, um, the, uh, the outcome of 1637 and the uncertainties in the aftermath of the uh, second attack, and even after 1636 um, um, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and later on, um, we see that the, um, uh, the Korean court constantly is looking for, at least in the first few decades, ways of trying to um, resist um, the Manchu. And that's part of the story that I find very fascinating is this attempt to push back against the Manchu in different ways. Uh, and of course, there's discussion of uh, Northern strikes against uh, the Manchu and also to reach out to Southern Ming loyalists. But a lot of this is just at the level of um, mm, yeah, like political um, dreams uh, without the real ability to carry uh, them out. So all of this was very conscious at the court and uh, was part of this rethinking of, uh, of Chosun with their relations with Ming and the decline and the, uh, the rise and the founding of the Qing dynasty, even though the, um, the, the Chosun accepted the, uh, the alliance, they never fully, as you know, really accepted um, uh, the Qing and the Manchu. So they found ways to backtrack and renege as they did in 1627, but less visible ways. And they were they did not fully uh, engage any of these uh, ideas and policies to try to uh, undermine uh, the Manchu and um, realign with uh, like southern Ming pro uh, southern you know pro, pro Ming uh, in the south. So Jay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, next by uh, Jonathan Chiarella. How instrumental was this period in building a distinct Korean culture and identity apart from the traditional Chinese culture? Some argue for primordial ethnic identities. Others say nations are a mo modern invention. And some say that the Indian wars were fundamental in forming a Korean identity. Where do you stand on the role of the, of, of the Manchu invasion, factional strife, and the end of the relationship relations with the Ming? Yes, my view is that this is a defining moment, right? That begins to unleash forces in society that really start to work towards redefining Korea's views of itself in the region, uh, these be China, and uh, re it begins to establish a sense of, uh, you know, national identity might be a little too strong of a word because, you know, the word na nation, nationalism, but yet definitely a sense of vernacularization of culture. Um, we have um, you know, more literature, more art uh, that looks inward towards Korea, uh, uh, growth in scholarship that begins to examine the world in different ways. So certainly uh, at many levels of society, much more so than any other time in Korea, we see a sort of a, a broadening and widening and even a deepening of understanding of you know, what it means to be uh, from this place, from Korea. So I really believe that it's this moment where things begin to launch off. But without the engine war either, of course, um, because it was the really you know, dramatic, uh, upheaval that, um, you know, and the, the violence that Japan unleashed against um, the Koreans, it was formative and it laid the groundwork uh, along with this greater geopolitical shift between the Ming and, and Qing and that set the ball in motion. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, your uh, response just now remind me of a jazz project. You know, the um, the you know the great um, East Asian War. I mean, yes. it was published, but unfortunately, she passed away before she was able to finish that project because initially her project was to include until Manchu invasions. Oh, was it? I see. Uh, Trying to really, you know, uh, understand the co more comprehensive narrative. Yeah. And also the rise of vernacular, right? I mean, oh, yes. the writing. Oh, 
Uh, yes. I know that she was also looking very, uh, you know, in very much in detail of those uh, letter exchanges. Uh, and, you know, the also, especially the um, looking at the, you know, the, the rise of vernacular letter uh -huh. uh, writings. So anyways, <laughs> all right, uh, thank you. Um, next question by Catherine Styers. Um, how do you think this narrative of the invasion play into or challenge current understandings of Korean identity, uh, particularly in regards to how South Korea frames interactions with foreign powers? Yes. Um, well, you know, during this time uh, in uh, during the Chosun Dynasty, this was seen as a, a, a non a non of the upheaval. Um, later, it became an, a uh, part of the, the narrative of foreign invasion. Uh, you know, why talked at a broader concept, and so this and other moments are an important part of sort of the way South Korea. Um, has began, begun to define its uh, national uh, identity, the narrative of the national identity. Um, and something that I explore in the book too is uh, the, the, not just the, the memory of 1636, but also the, the locations, the sites like Nam Han Mountain Fortress, you know, many other places too, the South Korean government has identified as important historical uh, monuments and even UNESCO sites now to promote their uh, awareness in Korea and beyond. So they are really important in um, preserving and maintaining this sense of memory, both as a way of, you know, in that narrative of Korea, not necessarily as victim, but uh, as an example of the many in invasions or attacks that Korea has experienced and um, withstood. But now also, I like to say as a, a reminder of how connected Korea was and is to the region and the world. Places like Nam Han Mountain Fortress, Kangwa Island, and the Diary of 1636 give examples of how Korea then and even now uh, is very much part of a wider regional and global narrative, not just national, a sense of national independent identity, but also contributes to the region and the world. Thank you. Uh, next question by Nam Lin Ho. Uh, well, wow, he asked three questions. Um, all right, so first question, regarding Chosun's military preparedness, after the Chongmyo crisis in 1627, what did Chosun do about his failed military? Did um, uh, what the Chosun government had tried for military strengthening, if any, specifically after 1627, make any difference in the war of 1636-37? If no difference was made, what was the real problem? Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you. Uh, 1627, yes, the government took some very specific moves to fortify, uh, increase fortifications in the north. Also, Nam Han uh, Mountain Fortress was also uh, expanded and uh, reinforced uh, from the very beginning of the century, and it, it continued through this period too. Uh, kind of the recreation of special um, firearm and uh, units, but unfortunately, none of it was really adequate to respond to the Manchu, and. I, I personally don't see it as a failure of Korean defenses, largely because the Manchu were so well equipped militarily. Um, there were no, there, there are no armies or soldiers that could really defend against um, the, the might of the Manchu. 1627 and 1636, another uh, reason I think is that the Manchu could rely on uh, military skills from a wide variety of people in, in both 1627-1636, uh, where the, the Koreans had to re respond primarily on uh, Korean uh, defenses and Korean soldiers. Um, and as well as they were prepared and they did very valiantly um, in 1637, there are many stories of Koreans fighting, but ultimately they were unable to overcome. And when I read and when I studied this period and, and wrote the book, I was really overcome by the level of uh, the brutality that the Korean army unleashed, not necessarily against the Manchu, but more so against themselves. Um, the 
the the the climate of of uh, you know of, I don't know how to put it, but um, uh, insubordination. Uh, what the court thought as insubordination and failure was, was often uh, penalized through harsh uh, military um, punishment and sometimes execution. But, you know, I've recently been watching some historical there again to, as an example of how to learn from history from this, some historical dramas from the 18th century and other parts of the world. Uh, and it seems as though harsh and brutal military um, punishment was not just something that uh, the Koreans did to themselves, but it seemed to be a, a broader military um, issue. But certainly um, the violence that the Korean army unleashed against soldiers who on the one hand fought very valiantly and won battles, but other times they did not have the supplies necessary. Uh, and so as punishment, the court um, you know, beat them or sometimes executed them. So that was, yeah, really awful part of the story of the, uh, the military response to the Manchu. But, you know, just in general, uh, Manchu, um, they were undefeatable at this point. Well, they were the rising power. They were the rising power. <laughs> they were. Uh, uh, next, uh, the second question, this is, I think, similar to, somewhat similar to um, the previous question we had, but from Namangap's view. So what did Namangap fear most when Kim Injo was surrendering to Hong Taiji? Did he ever imagine that the Joseon dynasty might be replaced with a new dynasty? And that as a result, its ruling class might be replaced. In other words, he and his family might lose all status and privileges, any sense of fear deep in his mind about himself and his family? Yeah, that's a great question. What did he fear the most? He feared, uh, at least demonstrated in the diary, the consequences of this defeat on the royal family. He's very worried about the crown prince and the crown princes uh, and the wife of the crown prince uh, because they were going north. Uh, he worried about King Injo as well. So in a way, that's a symbolic representation of the, the country, right? The royal family is the king and the crown prince, the future of Korea. So he was, he was concerned about uh, the nature, the survival of Korea, but not in the sense of the Manchu were going to change the dynasty. He wasn't worried about that. He was worried about the hardships. So the, the hardships that the the crown prince and the wife and other uh, elites had to go through when they went north, uh, kind of replicated the hardship that Korea and Joseon had to go, were going to go through. Um, coming to terms with the Manchu. You know, imagine the crown prince going up to Mukden uh, and living there, despite, uh, you know, the, you know, having lived through the issues in 1627 and 1637, or, you know, are these, are they going to live? Are they going to return alive? We don't know. Also, another thing that uh, Namangap was really worried about was his mother. His mother was very elderly. Wow, she was amazing. I think she was in her 90s. So he was, you know, ultimately uh, these Confucian values, understandably, uh, and filial piety, those were the things that concerned him the most. They were the surviving, survivability of the royal family and also uh, his own mother. Thank you for that. Um, so next question uh, by Sokyeon Hong. Um, he's a student of, um, he says, uh, Professor Emmanuel Kim's uh, oh. class. <laughs> well, thank you very much. For today. Um, it's, so King Injo chose only diplomacy to Ming instead of conducting neutral diplomacy between Ming and Qing, causing the war against Qing. Of course, the Ming dynasty collapsed on its own in the struggle due to civil war. So as a result, Joseon seemed to have made an unexpected bad choice. And maybe that is why many Koreans criticize King Injo a lot. As an expert on Korean history, could you please evaluate King Injo and government officials' reaction toward the war? Oh, you know, uh, what is that expression? Hindsight is 2020. <laughs> uh, it's hard to um, 
because I believe, just like in every country, many of the decisions that involve foreign powers often are more domestic. They're about domestic politics. So if we wanted to really fully understand uh, King Injo and come to terms with what sort of decisions he made, we'd have to really understand King Injo and the people who brought him to power to understand uh, what their motivation was to um, come to power against, you know, to depose Guanghegun and to bring uh, Injo to power. You know, he was young king, young king, and he was very malleable to these uh, older senior scholars around him. And so the decisions that he made uh, were the best that he could, uh, often advised by the people around him, but they were really in hindsight, poor choices ultimately, because uh, we understand um, what happened uh, in 1627 and then reneging on the promise ultimately brought Manchu troops back. Mm. And so, yeah, it's hard to say whether it's a coherent policy to unify these people against uh, the Qing to support the Manchu, or if it's a, it's a set of political decisions made by a small group of people around the court for other reasons that ultimately had this repercussion that sucked Korea into this big whirling uh, vortex between the Ming and the Qing. I know it's not a very satisfying answer. In other words, it's hard to say. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, next, we have a question by Yun Sun Yang. Uh, thanks so much for your inspiring talk. Can you briefly talk about your decision to render the word go into diary instead of perhaps record? A diary sounds more personal and private than go might convey. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in some ways, this is a very, um, it's, you're right, a diary in English can sound like it's about what you had for breakfast or about um, your love life. But diary here, uh, you know, record, it's, it's, very, it's a little bit more malleable, largely because he is writing his own personal experience during this siege. Um, and the first section itself is written as a day by day um, entry, right? As a, say a Western style diary might be where um, you know, a certain hour, a certain time of the day, this experience happens. But uh, you're right, after that section, then it becomes less clear that it's a personal diary and it's more of a record of the situations that are going on here. Um, and so I, I agree with you that, it, that it's a way of thinking of it both as a personal and a private understanding of the experience that he is going through. But then you could also say uh, that he was hoping to make his diary, the personal experience that he was going through, part of the national narrative. And so by sharing his story, he was making this personal for all readers in the future. Okay, uh, thank you. We have, um, I think I can put these two questions together from Hector Sanchez and Alexander Mansro. So does not offer any insight into why chosen opinion remained divided regarding the Manchu invasion, as opposed to the more unified attitude towards the Hideyoshi invasions. Does he lament, uh, lament such division? And uh, Alexander's question is also, how would you compare the historical significance of the Indian Wars and Manchu invasions of chosen Korea? So which were more important, so to speak? Naman Gap is very, it, it, it's not a straightforward uh, narrator. Um, and he's a little slippery and it's hard to, at times to fully grasp his intention and his, uh, his viewpoints. You know, he seems very opinionated sometimes, but in most times he withholds his opinion until after um, the war and after 1637. Uh, that, you know, the divisions uh, in Korean politics, uh, he's, in some ways, he, it's not as though he laments them, but he is more um, trying to find ways to navigate them. 
so you know, he's very concerned about the royal family uh, and which means that what will happen to Korea. Um, and he focuses heavily on the aftermath, uh, especially politicians and the consequences on their action and also their, uh, you know, moving up north uh, to the Manchu. So what he is really concerned about also is his own reputation. And that's something that I discuss in the introduction is that this is, you know, he, uh, he wants to defend himself as well. Um, so he uh, puts forth this diary, this record uh, as a way to remember history, but also to remember uh, his history and that he was in a sense loyal and a patriot, although not fighting um, of a different kind. He was a different kind of patriot. Um, and so the second question, oh, wow, it's very difficult. So which one was more historically important? Yeah. An engine? Yeah. I would, I'm going to shy away from that, <laughs> largely because it's hard to categorize agony <laughs> and uh, the, both moments were historically powerful uh, events. Many Koreans died in the Injun War. Um, Korea was you know, ravished. Um, and so the consequences of that had major repercussions on Korea. The Manchu uh, attacks both times, they were you know, very short-lived lightning strikes. Koreans died in this as well and it led to uh, upheavals of different types. So I, I like to really, rather than compare them, I like to just suggest that they are, are both important elements of understanding Chosun and late Chosun uh, history. That's a good question, I mean, answer. Yeah, really good question. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, Jin Sung Kim asks about Righteous Army. So unlike the Indian War, the activities of the Righteous Army is almost invisible. I'm curious if this is related to the divided opinions toward Qing in the Korean court. Mm -hmm. According to your presentation, there were pro-war and pro-peace factions. Yeah. Do please let me know if Namang got mentioned about the Righteous Army in his diary. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think one of the reasons why there is no greater appearance of these righteous armies, they do appear very small moment, but it happens so fast that there's no chance to respond. Where we see with the Japanese invasion, we see it protracted. And so, um, you know, Japanese soldiers are in Korean Peninsula for years. So there's this, a chance to mobilize, protect villages and regions by mobilizing, um, you know, what's called as righteous armies, but they're, they're you know, they're really um, kind of like village um, um, protectors and they rally and fight uh, against the Japanese. Here, it, there's no real like, chance for them to mobilize because the decisions, the attack, the decisions are made so quickly there, there's, for example, uh, there's no major mobilization of um, the, the, the militant monks, you know, the, the fighting monks, as you saw in the Imjin War, uh, they don't really appear here. Um, so there's no chance for local groups to coalesce and resist against the Manchu. The Man that's the Manchu strategy. They don't wanna remain in Korea. Right, 1627, they were there momentarily, they withdrew. They recognized the, the, uh, how to overcome this by launching a larger military strike, bringing back this time um, hostages, right? Um, and, and leaving behind a monument to the royal family, the elites and others who could read you know, classical Chinese and also Manchu and, um, and the Mongol, uh, uh, history of this era told through the point of view of the Manchu. And there was resistance against that <laughs> after many different ways. I think it even ended up in the Han River at some point. <laughs> but great question, yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Next question by John Lee. 
Um, I saw an interesting presentation by uh, Bai Hui Duan at Barcelona last week regarding epidemics in early 17th century Korea, possibly originating in the northern border region. Mm -hmm. Also, I've read in other studies that the Manchus were quite concerned about smallpox exposure in Korea. I was wondering whether any specific symptoms, contexts, or terms regarding disease are mentioned in uh, Namangap's diary. Yeah, that's a, an interesting question. Um, you know, I'm, I have a new project going on and partly also I'm looking at how these sort of diseases uh, impact uh, our concept of human animal relations. When I think about this moment in Naman Gap's work, no, I, I can't say. There is a moment where uh, King Injo is in Namahan Mountain Fortress, and there's discussion among some of the very senior security uh, members of his detail and uh, scholars of sneaking him out of Namahan Mountain Fortress and taking him to Gangwa Island where the um, other royal family members are and which was seen as safer. And uh, before he tries to go down, uh, but you know he's unable to ride his horse because it's very steep and he slips and there's a fear of him um, catching ill or getting sick. So, but largely I haven't seen that. No, I haven't seen that. What might be interesting is to look from uh, Manchu or, or Chinese records to see what they were saying about uh, the evidence of disease. Cause I know there was certainly smallpox uh, in the Northeast uh, at this time. So whether they were concerned uh, about it among their troops. I, you know, I haven't seen it from the Korean perspective, but it's certainly something to keep an eye out for. Okay, um, another uh, film question by Taewon uh, Chung. So mm -hmm. on the film on uh, Fortress, Naman Sansong. So mm -hmm. what do you think it does well? What do you think it could have done better? So he's particularly interested in the emphasis on the welfare of the people as being a priority of an enlightened leader. And I noticed you touched on this concern as you were discussing the epistolary struggle of the war. Do you think the film accurately reflects the key stakes of this conflict for the major players at this historical juncture? Yeah, I do. I think those are some important I know, big concepts and certainly the film depicts that in a good way. I would, I would say yes. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, the action is uh, really undermines it all too. So when you see these two sides in the film and also here, uh, what I found in the diary and studying this era, yeah, the narratives from both sides in some way, you can see the film replicating that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so another, so third question by, um, Nam Nin Ho. So how did Namanga collect information for the diary section on what was happening outside the Daman Fortress, for example, in Kangwa? To what extent did he tailor the hearsay he obtained and if he, he did or what? Yeah, really interesting question. For the first part of the diary where he's writing a day by day event, he's largely relying upon his own um, eyes and ears because uh, he's really present in so much of the discussion at the court. He does have many conversations. Um, he has, you know, generally decent relations since he's not really one of those super senior um, Sadebu members at the court. He's kind of working underneath. So he is able to move around and listen more. So, you know, he's, very, he's present many times during these discussions between the king and the king's advisors. He hears firsthand stories directly uh, that I uh, narrate in the diary of, you know, really very super detailed events taking place in the defense of Nam Han. The issue though is in the, in the later parts of the diary or the record um, where he is exiled now. And this was a fascinating uh, part of the story for me to understand is, you know, my understanding of um, exile usually means, ah, you know, you leave Seoul and you're basically done with everything. But in a way he's exiled from Seoul and he is still in touch and he's still getting records and he has connections that he, he has had, he's collected um, 
you know, written material, spoken to um, those who have been involved in, in the war. And so he has his fingers on many of the stories and the individuals who have played a vital role in this, in this war. Of course, he's telling one side of a story, for instance. Uh, and in particular, I think, you know, in his very final uh, conclusion of his diary, which is about, you know, a paragraph or so, he describes his desire not to forget these. And he is very certain to emphasize that he is trying to write a balanced history of this. And he's collected documents and such. So he is trying to use these to create a narrative uh, of the story. The Gangwa Island records in particular is just a, a wonderfully written um, historical uh, record uh, that would have gone, you know, would have been lost if he hadn't put together uh, all of these different different stories. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great piece of scholarship that Na has done here and all in exile. Okay, uh, thanks. I think this will be our last question. Uh, and and this, it's a very broad question. So okay. Maya, uh, Maya Stiller asks, um, I have a broad, broader question about your research focus, Chosun Dynasty. Mm -hmm. How do you pitch the value of studying pre-modern Korea to an audience of non-East Asianist or non-Koreanist? <laughs> yes, very good question. Well, Korea is important <laughs> for many ways and for many reasons. We can't get them into them here now. And pre-modern Korea in particular uh, helps us understand the Korea today. You know, we think that so much has changed, but there's a lot of continuity between uh, then and now. And I tell my students that, you know, it doesn't matter um, when you study ancient Greece or, you know, um, ancient Japan or whatever, the thing that you find and you uncover as students and researchers of a period of time that's really geographically distant or uh, culturally or linguistically different is that there's lots of resonance and the similarities to the issues that people had to go through then and live through that um, uh, kind of help you think of yourself. And it's like a mirror in some ways. So I certainly encourage the study of uh, pre-modern Korea, depending on no matter what your background is, uh, because you're going to learn a lot about Korea and also learn about your own society and yourself. Yeah, um, I, well, I would like to apologize in advance for the, you know, for the, um, for uh, the questions that I could not um, mm -hmm. ask. Uh, there were just, you know, many other uh, questions that were addressed, but I think, you know, related to this point, I mean, there's this one question by Mark Tokula, can you understand why some in Korea are comparing the U.S. to the Ming China uh, uh, Ming and Qing today. So I guess, you know, to understand Korea, yes. to these current <laughs> Korean yes. affairs, you would yeah. obviously have to understand what happened in the past. Yeah. And so um, that is why we study history. Uh, yes. And um, it's not that, you know, only uh, current affairs um, is important, but precisely to understand that we need to understand the past. So yes. I think uh, that concludes our event. We are already a little beyond our time, but thank you so much for your great presentation, um, George. This was wonderful. And I really think this is a great addition. This translation is a great addition that you know uh, scholars and especially for students uh, to read it, who want to understand uh, the war, uh, the Manchu invasion and uh, the you know, Manchu and the chosen relations um, during the time period of turmoil in East Asia, <laughs> in broader East yes. Asia context, right? Uh, okay, thank you once again. And also thank you so much for those uh, who stayed until the end with us. Um, hope to see you at, again at our third Chosun Book Talk series that's coming up soon on April uh, 6th, I believe. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you again. And thanks to everybody for the questions. Mm -hmm.